It happened one evening in a restaurant that served grilled chicken. On the table, as one would expect, stood a huge plate of chicken. A European-looking man named Hugo, a holy sign of Sagittarius, said that tomorrow Harry, the 13th awakened, was destined to die. Harry, who was sitting opposite, chewing chicken, asked discontentedly, Do you really think so little of me? The man's face was covered in scars, and he had one blind eye, and he had the hood of his jacket pulled over his head. Harry asked if it was because he had taken all the legs from the plate. A little angry, the man opposite replied that it was not like that at all. Continuing to chew his chicken, Harry said that he understood the reasons for his concerns, but he had nothing to worry about, and he was definitely not going to die. He chuckled and said that he had killed more misfortune bringers than all twelve constellations combined. So how could someone like him die? Hugo just clasped his hands together tensely and stared at the table. There is a demonic tower in this world. This tower is the home of a terrible monster that can bring death to all mankind. It all started on the last day of the 20th century. Namely, when the mighty ones who bring misfortune have driven humanity into a corner with their overwhelming power. They left behind only pitch darkness and chaos. And it was during this period that 12 gods appeared, calling themselves sacred beings. They vowed to give humanity the power to fight off all monsters, and they chose 12 people to be granted that same indescribable power. But one day something happened that no one expected. The 13th Awakened appeared, who was without the blessing of the sacred entity. Moreover, this Awakened One was so powerful and so incredible, and therefore even the 12 saints were not his equal. And this Awakened One was none other than Harry. Hugo and Harry reached the entrance to the demonic tower, where 12 saints were already waiting for them. Hugo thanked the man for the fact that it was thanks to him that they would be able to organize an attack on the demonic tower. Sitting down on a rock, Harry replied that words were not enough and that he wanted a five-year supply of fried chicken, to which the man asked him if he was not tired of it yet. And then he irritably noticed that the man continued to pronounce his last name incorrectly, to which Harry said that his last name sounded stupid. One of the saints, a girl with long blue hair, said with a smile that after defeating the red-eyed one, an incredible reward would await them, to which the man who was next to her chuckled and said that the reward would be at least $100 million, since this monster is considered the most terrible. Suddenly, Harry, covering his face with a scarf, told them that they would be better off asking for 10 years of accommodation in a seven-star hotel somewhere in Hawaii. And then he said that it would be better this way, because because of the red-eyed one, many countries are on the brink of crisis. The man who had spoken earlier about the reward grinned nastily and called the boy, and then, with the same grin, he asked him if he shouldn't raise his standards if he wanted to work with them, and if he didn't want to heal his disfigured face and body. Looking at their backs, Harry thought that they were not saints at all, just a bunch of scum who only cared about their own gain. Suddenly, the two turned around and addressed the guy again. Laughing nastily, the man told the guy to stop rushing to help everyone he came across, because only a few victims would recoup that price. The guy sighed heavily and said that it was time for them to go and he thought how good it was that he would never see them again after finishing this business. The saints entered the cave, long stalagmites hung from the ceiling, and everything around was illuminated by a warm glow. The saints stopped and looked up in amazement. They looked at something so big that they had to lift their heads. As it turned out, they were already in front of the Lord of the Demonic Tower, next to whom they all seemed like small flies. Harry thought that just one look at the Lord made him feel a terrible pressure. Suddenly the ruler opened his mouth from where something lit up, and his gaze did not leave the people who came to him. Everything around the cave shook violently, and the saints began to look around. The ground, unable to withstand the pressure, began to crack. The pressure was so strong that Harry put his hands out in front of him to protect himself as he began to be swept backwards. The stone in front of the ruler's throne cracked, and a bright light burst out from the cracks, and then a huge glowing pillar broke through the floor, rising upward. This pillar of light lifted up all the saints who were within its area of effect. A pillar of light burst from the roof of the castle, and everything around was illuminated. Soon this light faded, and everything around was filled with smoke. The frightened saints, who missed this pillar of light, hid against the walls of the castle. At their feet was a cliff, under which lay a whole lake of lava. The throne of the ruler remained untouched. Only the smoke from this blow hid it. The Lord raised his head smugly, looking around a wide smile on his face. The saint girl had already recovered a little from this action, but her body continued to tremble slightly, and she could only quietly say that they needed to run. And then she screamed, and all three saints who were still alive immediately ran back. Harry remained standing where he was, turning to face them, 
and quietly said that he couldn't believe that these bags of shit were called saints. He gripped the handle of his weapon tighter, thinking that it didn't matter to him anyway. After all, he will be the one who kicks this red-eyed guy's ass. And then he, breaking the earth, instantly rushed forward. With a sharp movement, he jumped up and found himself right at the level of the monster's forehead. The guy swung his weapon to strike. After some time, Harry continued to strike. He didn't know how much time had passed, but he didn't stop killing monsters. His eyes glowed with a terrifying blue light, and in his teeth there was a dagger. Only one thought was in his head. I must cut up monsters. In the shadow of the cave, many red eyes appeared, different in shape and size. A huge number of monsters appeared in front of Harry, who no longer had his jacket on, and he thought that this was a special trap in which more and more hordes of monsters were constantly appearing. Harry no longer had his left arm. His body was covered in scars, but his eyes continued to sparkle with a cold blue light, clenching his jaw even harder, causing his gums to bleed. He wondered if they all thought he would give in so easily. There was a mad light in his eyes as he promised himself and all the saints that he would survive and tear them all to shreds. Time moved forward inexorably, and now twenty years have passed since that moment. Harry was approaching another monster, who exclaimed that this could not be. He asked the man how he got there, to which Harry replied that he was the last one left. The monster pressed himself even more tightly against the stone and screamed in panic, begging for help. Harry raised his foot to step on the monster, a long beard already growing on his face, and he said that it was already over. Then he crushed the monster's head with his foot, sending blood spraying into the air. Standing in front of the corpse of the last monster, Harry sighed heavily and tiredly. Looking up at the sky, he noted that it was finally over, but suddenly everything around began to shake, causing stones to fall from somewhere above. The man weakened and began to fall to the ground, weakly saying that he would finally be able to get out of here, and everything around him continued to shake. And then he fell to the ground and the stones covered his body. After some time, it was already daytime outside, the city's high-rise buildings had long since been destroyed, and the air was brown from dust and dirt. The boy running next to the older man said that he had said that this was not the best way, to which the man replied that he had not known that things would turn out this way, and that he had been told that today was safer than usual. And as it turned out, several high-ranking monsters were chasing them. The guy, with tears in his eyes, exclaimed that everything was bad. And yet the fortune teller told him that today, he would meet a monster with whom he should not associate himself. One of the monsters suddenly pushed off the ground and jumped. And then, he landed right between the boy and the man. The guy fell to the ground and in anger, he hit the ground with his fist. As it turned out, they were now surrounded by these monsters and therefore could do nothing. As he got to his feet, the boy thought that if only Master Harry could return from the demonic tower, those damn monsters wouldn't dare to be here. And suddenly the gates of the demonic tower swung open. The boy and the man stared at this in surprise. And then there was an explosion. Trying to protect themselves from the gusts of wind, the boy and the man put their hands in front of them. And, as it turned out, part of the land was simply destroyed, causing a circle to form on the earth. The boy and the man were buried under rubble, and the second asked what it was. Suddenly he called out to the boy, calling him Charlie, and said that someone was coming out of the destroyed tower. And indeed, someone came out of the tower, and his strong hand appeared, with veins bulging on it. A lonely figure stood in the midst of this ruined area. This someone clenched his hands, cracking his fingers, and sighed with relief. Dark lightning appeared from his body, and the man exclaimed that these bastards had struck him in the back and left him to rot in this hole. He suddenly thrust his hand forward and shouted that they were now in complete shit. He then delivered a blow to the jaw of one of the high-ranking monsters, and he pinned another one to the ground with his foot. The man, who was still under the rubble, said that he couldn't believe that someone was able to easily deal with orange-class monsters. The man continued to beat the monsters, and a whole mountain of them accumulated under his feet. Then he got distracted, and then he suddenly jumped up, causing a column of dust to rise into the air. And then with one foot he smashed the debris under which Charlie and the man were, and they recoiled in fear. Falling to the ground, Charlie asked the man why he decided to attack them, to which the man merely said that it looked like his work here was done, and the others breathed a sigh of relief. And then Charlie asked his friend if this wasn't a real sensation, because some person was able to get out of the tower, to which he replied that this couldn't be, and he just happened to be nearby. Suddenly a shadow fell on the place where they were still sitting on the ground. As it turned out, it was a huge wolf, its eyes glowing red and drooling from its mouth. The men sitting on the ground screamed in fear that it was the leader of the pack, and then one of them shouted at the man that he advised him to run away from there. The monster's eyes glowed even brighter, and red lightning bolts erupted from its body. 
and then he opened his mouth from which a beam of red light burst forth. The men cowered in fear, pressing their hands to their heads. This beam of light illuminated the space in front of the monster, destroying everything around. The explosion was so powerful that it could be seen several kilometers away. Soon the light went out and everything became quiet. Charlie and his friend were surprised to notice that they were still alive. Opening their eyes, they noticed in front of them only the broad back of a strange stranger, who stood in a relaxed pose. Looking around, they noticed that the earth was destroyed by that beam, but they did not feel the impact because there was a man standing in front of them. Charlie's friend thought that perhaps this stranger had protected them. And then the stranger took off and jumped high into the sky, causing everyone else to look up. The man raised his hand to strike the huge dog. With one powerful blow, he smashed the beast's head into the ground. Charlie and his friend were quite surprised by this. The stranger landed on the ground with a grin on his face. And then he proudly turned to the men, while the corpse of the monster lay behind him. He said that he was definitely finished now, but he himself noted with displeasure that it stunk in there. And then his gaze moved somewhere to the side, and he quietly muttered something. He turned to the men standing behind him, causing them to flinch in fear. The man began to turn towards them to say something, his whole body radiating some kind of unkind green light. The men shook with fear, trying to understand what he wanted to tell them. But the stranger only smiled good-naturedly and asked them to buy him some food. He scratched his head awkwardly while the men just fell silent in shock. And then he added that clothes wouldn't hurt either. After some time, the stranger and the two men reached a small cafe. The man put the now-empty plate on the table with a sharp movement. Charlie's friend glanced at the check and, noticing the cost of the meal, practically gave up the ghost. And then they indignantly asked the stranger how he managed to eat $1,000 worth of food, to which he replied, But you said you didn't have much money, so I ordered just a little. He then turned around to order another helping, and noticed that they themselves had spoken of their willingness to pay for his dinner for saving their lives, at which Charlie's friend shouted indignantly. Charlie, covering his ears, asked the stranger who he was and why he was near the tower. The man, chewing on a toothpick, replied that he had been inside the tower and then simply walked out of it to which surprised exclamations were immediately heard, and the man said that he had one more question. He asked them who they were because they looked like ordinary townspeople, but they emitted a magical aura. Charlie's friend replied that it was because the guy was a Templar, and then he asked him if he himself was a Templar. Picking up his spoon from the table, the stranger replied that he had no need to wag his tail in front of some big shot, but suddenly something surprised him. He looked at his reflection in the spoon, and suddenly his face became distorted as if from fear and cold sweat ran down his face. He slammed his hands on the table, stood up with a sharp movement, and exclaimed that he urgently needed a mirror, to which the waitress quietly pointed it out to him. Approaching the mirror, the man began to take off the clothes he had received. He stared at the mirror in shock, his hand almost touching his face. He noted that his body was completely healed. Harry thought that his old wounds were so terrible that there was no point in even trying to heal them. And then he came to his senses and noticed that his left hand was also in place. He looked at his palm, which now had some kind of round mark on it. When the man looked at it, the sign began to appear, and a snake became clearly visible on his palm. Suddenly, Harry felt a strong pain in his arm, which made him grab it tightly. The veins on his arms bulged. The guy's body began to emit green light, and the outline of a snake appeared behind his back. The man closed his eyes, and when he opened them, he was no longer in the cafe. His whole body seemed to have turned into a disembodied spirit. In front of him was a huge snake, which looked at him with its red eye. The man seemed tiny compared to the snake, and the snake released its thin tongue. Harry reached out to touch her. When he did this, a bright light shone from the place where they touched, and then everything around lit up with a bright yellow light. The next moment, Harry woke up sitting on the floor of the cafe with his hand extended forward. Charlie extended his hand to help the man up and asked him if he was okay. Harry waved his hands and asked if they had seen a huge snake, to which they only stared at him. Charlie said they didn't see any snake. They just saw him suddenly take off his clothes and run to the mirror, and then start screaming while clutching his wrist. Looking at his palm again, the man concluded that it seemed like no one else could see it except him. And then the man felt something behind him. As it turned out, these were some tablets with text that said that he had survived death. And now he became the owner of the constellation Ophiuchus, as well as a description of his abilities. One of his skills was super regeneration, and Harry thought that he had never heard of other saints seeing anything like that before. Moreover, he does not feel the energy of sacred beings. However, be that as it may, he was satisfied with this arrangement because his body had fully recovered. Now, he needed to track down the traitors who had left him for dead, and especially the one who had stabbed him in the back. 
Harry, thinking about this, tensed his hand, causing his veins to bulge, and he said that this whole body began to tremble just from the thought of revenge. And Charlie and his friend, noticing the strange behavior of the man, shook with fear. At the same time, somewhere in the place where the incident took place, police tapes were already hanging. The man standing nearby said that the demonic tower, which was considered an indestructible fortress, had suddenly collapsed, to which the other replied that this news would soon set the whole world on its ears. The first one said that this place has a special connection with Harry. Could this be the work of his followers or other saints? The second man replied that it was interesting, and then he told the other to look at the one who was pulling. He said that this was a monster that was difficult for even high-ranking saints to deal with, so who else could challenge such a monster and destroy the tower? Then the first man asked if Harry had really gotten out of the tower alive. Another told him that they couldn't be sure of that. They could only wait until new leads appeared. At the same time, something was happening in one of the city's multi-story buildings. There were many cameras in one of the rooms of this building. The reporters approached Victor and asked him how he could comment on the destruction of the demonic tower and whether it was possible that Harry had returned alive. Victor, who was the holy sign of Ares, stood on the stage and did not answer. Taking the microphone, he said he had no comment on the matter, and then he and his bodyguards left the room while reporters shouted after him, wanting answers. An expensive car was driving along the road at great speed. Victor, who was sitting in it, hit the armrest with force, breaking his glasses. He grimaced and exclaimed that he had heard Harry's name so many times today. He wondered if he had really been alive all this time in the demonic tower, all 20 years. Putting his hand into his vest, he thought that this couldn't be possible because there were thousands of deadly creatures there, and they were all black class. He took his pipe out of his pocket, thinking that it was a miracle that they had managed to escape from there, having stolen the red-eyed man's throat, and there was no way the man could have survived there. He bit his pipe and thought about how Harry's body was on edge due to the monster's deadly attacks, and he didn't even wear armor like all the other saints. He frowned, thinking that perhaps he really was still alive. Thinking about this, he exhaled a huge cloud of smoke, and then, clenching his jaws, he hissed that then it would be the end of them all. Meanwhile, Harry took Charlie's phone and said that he should start with this bastard. Meanwhile, a plane arrived at one of the airports, and only one person came out of it, who was greeted loudly. The bodyguards exclaimed that it was an honor for them to meet one of the Twelve Saints. As it turned out, the one who arrived on that plane was Hugo, the holy sign of Sagittarius. Descending to the ground, he asked the still bowing men where the Prime Minister was, and they replied that he was waiting in his office and that transport was ready. Hugo immediately headed towards the car, and the bodyguards bowed even lower. One of them, looking after the man, remarked with admiration how majestic he was. He said that this is exactly what a truly chosen person should look like. The car drove quickly along the road. Hugo sat silently on the seat, crossing his legs and looking out the window. Suddenly, his phone vibrated. Somewhat annoyed, he thought that it must be those annoying reporters again, and he couldn't believe that rumors about Harry's return had become so popular. He angrily turned the phone face down and exclaimed that 20 years had already passed, and his phone finally went silent. Frowning, the man stared out the window again. He remembered his words to him 20 years ago about Harry being destined to die tomorrow. As Harry replied, he had no idea that he had such a low opinion of him. Thinking about how when they attacked the demonic tower, at Harry's request, he went outside and held back the incoming hordes of monsters. He wanted to believe that his premonition was deceiving him, and that Harry would be able to get out alive. That day, after leaving the cave and meeting the other saints, the wounded Hugo asked them why Harry was not with them. And then it turned out that the saints who had entered Harry together had abandoned him and returned with the head of the red-eyed man. This event became known to the whole world. Twenty saints, including himself, were recognized as heroes and gained even greater influence. Hugo, unable to believe that Harry was dead, asked again and again to begin searching for him. But Jean-Louis, the holy sign of the dark cancer, answered him with a grin that it was time for him to stop. He said that he knew perfectly well about the number of monsters in the demonic tower, so there was no chance that Harry survived. With an even more disgusting grin, the man said that if Hugo was so worried about Harry, then he could go looking for him alone. No one would stop him. But then the list of saints would be reduced to 11. Hugo didn't respond to this. He just clenched his jaws tightly, grinding his teeth in anger. Thinking about this, the man's mood worsened and he unbuttoned the top button of his shirt. Looking out the window, he thought that no matter how strong Harry was, he couldn't survive. And besides, too much time had passed. Suddenly, the driver announced that the prime minister was calling him. The man took the call, and the prime minister asked him if he could talk, 
to which he replied that he could and asked what was the matter. The Prime Minister asked him if he had heard the news yet, and then said that it seemed the demonic tower had been destroyed. Hugo clutched his head and sighed wearily, wondering if this story was happening again. And then he said that if the man wanted to ask him to start looking for Harry, then he had to refuse. Frowning, she said that the man died that day and that the incident with the tower was most likely a setup by his fans. And then he told the Prime Minister not to even hope to get more votes with this, to which he replied that this was not at all the case. He said that if the report that had just been transmitted to the South Korean government was true, then a call had been made to that number very recently. Not understanding what was going on, Hugo asked what kind of challenge this was. The Prime Minister replied that the call had been made to Harry's personal phone number, causing Hugo to shudder all over. He pounded his fists convulsively on the back of his chair and cried out, asking if it was true. And then, in a panic, he ordered the driver to stop the car. The wheels stopped abruptly, raising dust from the road. Reaching for the phone, Hugo thought that it might have been Harry calling him then. Looking at the screen, he saw that it said that he already had 39 missed calls and a voice message sent. The man stared at his phone screen with his mouth wide open. He tapped the phone screen to call the number that had called him recently. He sat tensely in his chair as the phone continued to ring. Suddenly the call was answered and a voice came from the receiver, calling the man by the nickname Harry had called him. And then Harry told him in English that he would find him and kill him. And then he happily said goodbye to him. Hugo's mouth was wide open when he heard that voice. He realized that that manner of speech was so similar to Harry. Could he really be alive? And then he screamed, ordering the driver to return to the airport. Meanwhile, Harry was still sitting in the same cafe. He looked at the phone screen with a menacing grin and said that Hugo had grown up and now even dared to ignore his calls. Charlie asked him who he was calling so persistently, to which Harry simply replied that it didn't matter. And then he said that this smartphone, as the guy called it, is just an amazing thing. Harry said that he entered the tower in 2005, and now in 2025 the world has become a much better place, to which Charlie asked him if this was the first time he used a smartphone, and then he said that with it he can connect to the internet and even follow the news. The man peeked out from behind his smartphone and asked if he could then watch the news about Harry. Charlie, pointing to his phone screen, replied that of course, since it was the hottest topic of discussion right now. And immediately a lot of different news and posts about Harry appeared on the phone screen. However, all the comments were negative, some were afraid of Harry, others didn't respect him and called him a loser. The man, reading this, got angry and squeezed the phone too hard, causing Charlie to scream in fear. Grinding his teeth, Harry exclaimed, asking who saved them from the red-eyed man. And yet these saints did nothing for them, and they praised them. He exhaled, calmed down and said that he should just ignore it, which was kind of sweet. Looking at his phone screen again, he saw the news about the revision of the will that Harry left. He decided to give all his fortune to orphanages and educational institutions in the event of his death. Remembering this, he smiled weakly and said that he hoped that all the money reached the recipients, and then he poked at the screen to see the news. But as it turned out, the news was about Harry leaving all his property, including relics, to the saints, in the hope that they would use them wisely for the benefit of the whole world. The man got angry again, but with even greater force, which made him squeeze the phone so hard that it shattered into small pieces, and he screamed that he would definitely strip them of their pathetic skins. Charlie fell to the floor next to the remains of his phone, a stingy tear running down his cheek as he said goodbye to the phone. Sitting back down at the table, Harry thought about what he should do. He thought about warning them about his return, but his appearance was very different from what it was 20 years ago. And even if he went out into the street and started shouting that he was that same Harry, no one would believe him. Therefore, he should torture each of the twelve saints separately, and he should go to the bottom for some time. Suddenly, he felt something approaching him from behind. A message appeared warning him that he was being watched, and Harry noted that he recognized the aura. He decided to leave the cafe, and noticing him, Charlie asked him where he was going, to which the man replied that he was going to get some fresh air. After leaving the room, he stopped on the street, and looking up at the sky, he was able to notice many spirits of some kind. As it turned out, these were avatars in the form of rams. Upon noticing them, Harry immediately realized that these were animals of the holy sign of the White Ares. There have been reports that these avatars have recreated the barrier in the name of the White Ares, and therefore the influence of other constellations has been neutralized and the avatars demand tribute. Clenching his fist, the irritated man said that even if they were sucking up to the sacred entities, who were they trying to command? However, then he heard someone calling his name, which made him turn around, still irritated. 
It turned out that it was some couple of people, and the man said that everyone was doing nothing but talking about this Harry, and the noise from this chatter would soon finish him off. The woman who was walking next to him, holding his hand, replied that she was talking about the same thing, and that this stupidity was being reported on all the news. The man, lighting a cigarette, said with a grin that, although the man's name was not tarnished, he was amazed that everyone had suddenly started showing interest in him. On the man's cardigan, a golden badge with the sign of the Gemini constellation glittered. Charlie, who followed Harry out, noticed this and realized that these people were from the Twins Constellation Squad. Frowning, the man from the Gemini Constellation Squad noticed someone standing in his way. Charlie shouted at Harry to come back quickly and not to provoke these people. However, Harry didn't seem to hear him and continued to stand in place. The irritated man asked Harry what he was looking at and then ordered him to get out of there. Charlie and his friend, seeing this, became completely dejected and thought that they were finished. The man standing in front of Harry raised his hand to inhale more smoke from his cigarette, and then he exhaled all this smoke straight into the man's face, practically standing close to him. Noticing the displeasure on the man's face, the member of the Gemini Constellation Squad asked him if there were any problems, and then he leaned his forehead against him and defiantly told him to hit him if he had any problems. The woman who was with the man immediately told him to calm down, otherwise the boy was going to shit his pants. And then the couple started walking past, calling him a coward. They started to drift further and further apart, and the man said that all these idiots who were fanatics about Harry were no different from each other, and the woman supported him. And then, she asked why this weakest saint was so popular with everyone, and whether the very act of canonizing him as a saint was absurd in itself, and these questions seemed to pierce the man's head. Charlie ran up to calm Harry down and told him that he had behaved well, and that it was good that he had not provoked the representatives of the Gemini constellation. However, the next second, Harry turned to the departing couple and shouted at them, calling them cockroaches. The couple turned around incredulously and asked again if he was talking to them. Completely furious, Harry replied that he was talking to them, and then he cracked his fists. The man from the Gemini Constellation Squad immediately turned around and walked back quickly. He stood face to face with Harry, pressing his forehead against his, and asked him irritably what he had just said. And then he started talking about how he was just a pathetic simpleton from whom there was not even a magical aura. But suddenly someone's hand rose above his head. Harry quickly flicked his finger to the man's forehead, sending him flying. He slammed into the wall of the house with a sharp movement, raising dust, and his woman screamed. Charlie and his friend froze in panic as they watched this. Harry stood there with a smug grin, his shirt blowing in the wind and his fingers still steaming. The woman decided that she could not stay away, and so she decided to use her ability, causing her body to turn into white light. A second later she was behind Harry, but he immediately noticed her, asking her if she really thought he wouldn't notice her. And then with another click he sent the woman flying, causing her to crash into the wall of another building. Touching his face with his hand, he quietly called these people losers. Charlie's friend exclaimed that using magic in the middle of the street was strictly prohibited, to which Harry replied that if he had used magic, there would have been no trace of those losers left, to which Charlie and the man were surprised to think that Harry had knocked out two A-rank Templars with just brute force. Harry suddenly noticed something and lowered his head a little, and then he crouched down to get closer to the man he had knocked out. He carefully picked up the medallion that hung around the man's neck, and then, with one sharp movement, he tore it off. And then he said that this is exactly what he felt when he hit the man, and he asked if it was a relic. Having looked at the medallion more closely, he asked where these people had obtained the relic, since only saints should have them. In response, Charlie asked the man if he really knew absolutely nothing. And then he said that several decades ago, humanity was practically wiped off the face of the earth. But thanks to sacred beings and the constellations they chose, people managed to survive this disaster. However, only 12 people could not protect this entire vast world. And so they decided that they had to start gathering followers, which today are called branches. Those who were given a piece of the power of the saints began to be called Templars. Such people began to be divided into ranks, according to their level of power. First saints, then cardinals, then bishops, and finally templars. The main source of strength for the templars is their faith, so there is strong competition and recruitment between branches. Thus, the chosen templars receive relics from sacred entities from time to time. Hearing this, Harry thought that things had changed a lot in 20 years, but suddenly the guy pointed something out to him. As it turned out, the avatars that had previously just been hanging in the air were now all gathered around the man. There are reports that the avatars of wealth and greed which are associated with the constellation of the White Aries, are enjoying this situation, 
They demand that the man quickly deal with the couple, and for this they promise a worthy reward. Charlie's friend, with his mouth wide open, told about Harry having attracted the attention of the avatars. These avatars were like reflections of the sacred beings themselves, and standing in their way was like challenging the gods themselves. The man exclaimed that they should hurry up and do as they asked, but Harry only laughed. He snapped his fists again and said that now he understood why he had felt that the stinking aura of Ares was so present, and that they were intending to fill their bellies, just like that pig. Putting his hands in his pockets, Harry took a step forward, saying that in the end, nothing had changed. He kicked the ground hard, causing the stone to crack, and everything around began to fill with Harry's turquoise aura. This aura began to attack the Ares avatars, causing them to make sounds of pain. A bright light illuminated everything around, causing Charlie and his friend to cover their eyes with their hands. And then the avatar barrier began to slowly disappear, and soon there was almost nothing left of it. And Harry said that they were showing off no matter what, even though they were worthless losers. Charlie looked around in surprise, not believing that the white Ares constellation had retreated. Looking at Harry again, he thought that this man was not an ordinary person. Harry called Charlie by name, and he immediately rushed to respond. And then he asked the guy again whether he had said that this couple belonged to the branching of twins. The guy replied that it was true, and in their country the twin branch had the greatest influence. It was an elite group that had gathered two-thirds of all major corporations. Then Harry asked if that meant they had a lot of money. He grinned menacingly and asked that then the clothes they wore must be expensive too. The man again went down to the other one and began to take off his clothes, saying that it was time for him to make some good money. After some time, all three reached some house. Pointing his finger at one of the windows, Charlie said that he lived on the second floor, and his friend said that his door was right next door. Charlie bowed to Harry and thanked him for saving their lives and even walking them home. However, there was no response, so the guy carefully opened one eye. Yawning, Harry asked them if they were going inside because he was already sleepy and he had clothes in his hands, while Charlie indignantly thought that this guy decided to spend the night with them. But the guy still let the man into the house, and he quickly took off his clothes, and strands of black hair flew onto the floor. Harry, now with his hair cut short, stood in front of the mirror, his hands on his hips, and then he looked at himself in the mirror and grinned. Charlie, seeing his new look, raised his finger up and said admiringly that the short haircut suits him very well. He exclaimed that the man looked even cooler now, causing Harry to become a little embarrassed and look away. He smirked as he thought about how in the past, due to the side effects of his abilities, he treasured every hair. Who knew that he would be fine with it now? But then he heard some sound and frowned. As it turned out, it was a mosquito, and the man asked what this attractant forgot in the apartment. With a sharp movement, he grabbed it and squeezed it tightly. When he released his hand, the remains of the attractant fell to the floor, and Charlie raised another finger up and said that even experts couldn't do this. And then he began to catch even more of the tempting ones. He asked why they were so attracted to him, to which the guy replied that perhaps they were attracted by his smell. But Harry, looking around, said that this usually happens when something is wrong with the house. His gaze caught on a shelf that was filled with all sorts of things, and he said that now it was clear why these creatures flocked here, and who would keep such abominations in the house anyway. Charlie said that all these things were received from the twin constellation personally. The guy said that these artifacts did not belong to him, but the saint blessed them. But suddenly something cut the statuette. The boy fell to the shards in panic, and Harry looked at his hand with disgust. Then he took the mask in his hands and said that this thing is intended for surveillance of the buyer. Continuing to rummage through the boxes, he threw out all the artifacts, along the way reporting what they do, and their effect was bad. The man asked whether these saints had not only appropriated his property, but had also started selling such disgusting goods. The man became very angry and said irritably that the very thought made him furious. He shouted loudly for the guy to throw it all away, and at that time someone was standing behind the door and heard all these shouts. Charlie was hopelessly trying to take at least one artifact from the man, when suddenly the door opened, and a red-haired guy appeared on the threshold of the apartment. Harry asked who the guy was, and Charlie started to break out in a cold sweat and quietly called the guy's name, calling him Scott. Scott's face darkened and he asked again who he was, and then he himself answered that he was the owner of this apartment, and suddenly his blue aura burst out. Hearing this, the man immediately calmed down, and the entire apartment was in chaos with broken artifacts. Meanwhile, Victor was already at his residence. He, in shock, asked again about the Korean avatars having disappeared. The subordinate, who was kneeling in front of the stairs, replied that this was indeed the case, and that it had caused a great deal of fuss in Korea. Gritting his teeth, Victor wondered who could have done something like this. 
He thought that the avatars were direct representatives of sacred entities, and therefore only someone unusually strong could disperse them. The man told his subordinate to contact the other saints and ask them if she had anything to do with this. The subordinate replied that he understood, but the shooter had not been in touch for a long time, to which the man replied that this was no cause for concern, since Hugo had warned that he was going to get a new position in the UK. The subordinate then said that they were informed that upon arrival at the UK airport, he immediately transferred to another flight. This made Victor turn around and he asked where the man was heading, to which he was told that Hugo had gone to South Korea. Victor thought, rubbing his chin with his hand. He thought that Hugo was on good terms with Harry. So could his actions be connected to tears about the return of that bastard? Could it be that he actually survived? The man cursed quietly and grabbed the candelabra. And then he shouted that this was all ridiculous nonsense and threw the candelabra at the floor, which his subordinate barely managed to dodge. Victor cried out for him to report to him more clearly. And then he asked what else was there. The man replied that an unconscious branching Templar had been found at the place where the avatars had disappeared. He was lying in the middle of the street wearing only his underwear. And also, according to witnesses, before this he got into a fight with a handsome young man. Victor latched onto the word handsome, and then he assumed that it couldn't be Harry, since his face was covered in scars. He thought that things weren't going too well anyway, and it was entirely possible that he had managed to get out alive. For some unknown reason, the Korean avatars disappeared. And what's worse is that they failed to finish off the Spider Queen. Victor clenched his fist tightly, thinking that at this rate his position could be in jeopardy. And then he ordered that his plane be prepared, to which his subordinate raised his head and asked him if he was really going to go there personally. The man answered in the affirmative and said that he wanted to see everything with his own eyes. He grabbed a coat that was lying nearby and swung it around, throwing it over his shoulders. He frowned and said that he absolutely had to see for himself all this hell that was going on in Korea. And he walked forward, lighting a cigar. Meanwhile, the member of the twin branching was taken to the twin branching hospital in Korea. The man was lying on a bed with sensors attached to his chest, and on his face he had a breathing mask. An old man approached the man's bed. His hair was gray and his head was almost bald. His face had age spots. The old man exclaimed, asking who dared to harm his grandson. When no one answered him, he turned to the man standing against the wall, and the man said that there was no need to worry so much. The man replied that the saint of the Gemini constellation had sent him specifically to sort this out. This man's name was Mike. He was a Templar of the S-class of the Gemini branching. Meanwhile, Harry and Charlie told Scott everything, and he asked again whether they had really met at the Demonic Tower. He continued asking about the events, clearly not believing them, and Charlie just nodded in panic, sweat running down his face. Scott screamed at him to stop lying to him, and besides, the man had destroyed all of his artifacts, to which Harry said they were fakes anyway. The guy asked the man what branch he was from, to which the man asked him if he really thought he needed something like that. Then, an irritated Scott asked what god he believed in then, to which Harry replied that he didn't need those twelve idiots. The guy asked his rank, to which he also did not receive a normal answer. Then, he decided to ask his name. The man, also irritated, replied that his name was Harry. Scott could no longer stand this irritation, and Charlie hastened to calm him down. The guy's blue aura swirled around him, and he said that the man had broken into someone else's house without permission and destroyed all the relics. The light from the aura became even brighter, and a figure appeared above his head as he exclaimed that this bastard still dared to call himself by the name of the Great Harry. Charlie called Scott again, yelling at him not to destroy their apartment. An alert went out that a magical outburst from a follower of the twins had been detected, and Harry said that it looked like this tough guy was determined to destroy this house. The man then activated one of his new skills, God's Gaze. Then, information appeared that Scott was a follower of the A-Rank Twins. His nickname was Crushing Blow. Information appeared about his skills and personal traits, and the most important was his trait, Genius, thanks to which the effect of training was 200%. Harry thought that at such a young age the boy already possessed high-ranking skills. The trait of Genius was clearly not just for nothing. A figure appeared above the boy's head and screamed loudly, causing his eyes to glow blue. Trying to defend himself, Charlie shouted at the man to run as fast as he could, as Scott was a high-ranking Templar and also a crazy fan of Harry. Scott then asked the guy if he was crazy and then told him to get out of his way if he didn't want to get swatted. But the man suddenly appeared behind him with a grin on his face and said that the guy was playing with fire so hard that he was in danger of peeing his pants. Hearing his voice behind him, the guy immediately hurried to turn around. But when he did, the man immediately sent him flying with his flick. Scott fell to the floor, his blue aura fading, 
and the man said that at this rate, this idiot would have burned down not only his apartment, but the entire house. Charlie asked in a panic if he was okay, to which Harry replied with a grin that everything was great. However, this did not completely convince the guy, and he looked at his friend uncertainly. Meanwhile, Scott lay unconscious on the floor, with a huge bump on his forehead and foam coming out of his mouth. Harry went to his room to take a nap, and Charlie began to slow down Scott so that he would wake up. The man entered one of the rooms and slowly closed the door, and then he froze and stopped at the door, looking around the room. The entire table was covered with hairy figurines. The man with a darkened face asked what it was, to which Charlie said that he had said that Scott was obsessed with Harry, and the guy, who had already woken up, asked him to be careful with the figurines. But the man immediately broke one of them, saying that they irritated him, and therefore he needed to at least tear off the head. Charlie tried to drag his friend out the door while he screamed at the man that he was a fucking psycho, to which the man responded that he was Harry, not a fucking psycho. Scott screamed hysterically, tears running from his eyes and snot from his nose, his face twisted in pain. Meanwhile, someone was sitting in one of the cafes in Korea. News reports indicated that yesterday afternoon, two members of the twin lineage were attacked by an as-yet unidentified individual with the stated intent of stealing items. Hugo, who was sitting at the table, covered his face with his hand, thinking that this was definitely Harry's doing. And what was he thinking? The waitress approached the man and, with a smile on her face, asked him if he was ready to order. But the man irritably told her that Victor should stop this clown show and get out of here. Victor, in the body of a waitress, answered with a grin that he had figured him out too quickly, and therefore, it was not interesting. And then he said that he hadn't been able to contact him for a long time, and therefore was glad to see him. He leaned on the man's shoulder and said that, judging by his hasty arrival in Korea, he came here because of Harry, and therefore he should tell him everything. Hugo snapped his fingers and said that this is exactly why he hates this pervert who steals people's bodies. The girl's body jerked in response to this, and she came to her senses. And then she asked, confused, what she had just done. The man slammed his fist on the table and thought about how he needed to get to Harry as quickly as possible. The next day, Charlie and Scott went to the hypermarket. Charlie asked his friend if the man could really be Harry, to which he replied that he looked completely different. And then he cried out that Harry is also a hero of humanity, he can't be such a redneck. To which the guy replied that he definitely saw him coming out of the demonic tower, and his strength was amazing. But Scott only answered once again with confidence that this couldn't be, because his father had told him so. And then he quickly hushed up the subject. Suddenly someone shouted that there was a thief here, and the guy stopped, looking around. And then something suddenly knocked them off their feet and turned over their cart, as it turned out. It was that same thief. Falling to the floor, Charlie noticed that he was very fast, which meant that he was from the Scorpio branch, and his friend said that he was wasting his powers on bad things. The thief began to rush quickly from side to side, stealing everything he could. The thief thought that these pathetic Templars could never catch up with him. He gritted his teeth, thinking that he had already made enough money, and therefore it was time for him to go. But before he could do so, someone hit him in the stomach, stopping him. The blow caused the man's eyes to open wide and turn red, and drool began to flow from his mouth. It turned out to be Harry, and Charlie asked him what he was doing there, to which he replied that he had forgotten to tell them to buy some chicken. Then someone told the man that he was very good, since he was able to catch a member of the Scorpion branch, considering their speed. It turned out it was Mike, and he said that the man was just an ordinary follower, and therefore it would be better to call the police next time. Harry looked at the man and wondered what kind of guy he was. But the next moment everything behind them shook, causing the men to turn away from each other. The rest of the people in the hypermarket were also scared by this shaking. The thief, who had already come to his senses, thought that this was an excellent chance for him to escape, and then he quickly rushed forward towards the doors. He thought that he could have been caught because of this strange man. But the earthquake came in handy. But suddenly he noticed that the floor in front of him began to crack. He managed to stop, and the next moment a huge monster in the form of a centipede jumped out of the ground. The thief raised his head and asked why the attractant appeared in the green zone. He took a step back, thinking that he needed to get out of here before it was too late. And then he jumped high into the air. The man grinned and thought that, even though this creature was strong, it would never be able to catch up with him. But at that very moment, a monster's wide-open mouth appeared at the side of the man, causing the man's face to freeze. The monster devoured the man, and then he sank to the ground, and the crowd could only watch. And, as it turned out, there was someone sitting on the monster's back. The Spider Queen looked coldly at the crowd below with her red eyes. A message came from the loudspeakers that an emergency had occurred. 
a bad guy had appeared in the hypermarket, and everyone needed to return to the building immediately. Meanwhile, the monster rushed at the crowd, which was running away in panic to return to the building, and a voice announced that due to the invasion of the Spider Queen, this zone was turning red. The alarm was still sounding, people were panicking and trying to escape, and one little boy stopped in the middle of the road crying loudly. The monster's mouth opened wide, and he was about to devour this easy prey. But before that happened, Harry landed on the monster's head. The boy froze, looking at his savior, his body shaking slightly, and Harry told him that he should be more careful. The man extended his hand to him with a smile on his face, his eyes shining with a turquoise light, and he asked if he was hurt. But the next moment the boy rushed forward, running away from his savior. The man cleared his throat awkwardly and said that the boy seemed to be okay. Rising to his feet, he asked what this giant was doing here. The monsters began to pounce on the man, and then a turquoise snake began to form next to him. The snake's head appeared next to him, and the man asked about how today he would be able to have fun for the first time in a long time. Meanwhile, the black car was driving quickly along the road. Victor, who was sitting in this car, asked his subordinate to repeat it. The subordinate said again that the creatures that brought misfortune appeared in the middle of the hypermarket, to which the man asked him to repeat the name of that creature. Then he said that they were told that it was the Spider Queen. Hearing this again, Victor thought about how they had failed during the raid, and he had barely managed to put the seal, had she already escaped? Clenching his fist, he thought that there was no way he could defeat a red-class monster on his own. After the appearance of the wallpapers that bring misfortune, they began to divide locations into six classes according to the level of danger, where the blue zone is a blessed abode, green zone is a safe zone, the yellow zone is a zone of slight danger, the orange zone is the zone of monsters that pose a great threat to life, and the red zone is the zone where deadly monsters have gathered. The black zone is a zone where life is impossible. Since the Spider Queen has appeared in hypermarkets, it is now a red zone. Victor's driver asked him what they should do now. After a short silence, the man replied that they needed to seal everything. He thought that no one should know anything. If the public knew about the failure of the last raid, they would lose their reputation. In a bit of a panic, Victor told her subordinate to tell them that they could no longer save those inside and to send the Templars to completely seal off the building. Meanwhile, some bubbling sounds continued to be heard in the hypermarket. The monsters continued to advance in numerous hordes. Mike put his hands out in front of him, and everything around him was illuminated by a cold light, and he exhaled steam from his mouth. He dropped to the ground and touched it with his hands, causing it to freeze, and this ice moved towards the monsters. The ice reached the monsters and they found themselves bound by it. The man, wiping sweat from his face, told them not to dare underestimate them. But the next moment, a crack appeared in the ice. And then, with a furious roar, the monster broke through its icy cage. Panicked, Mike wondered how they had managed to do it so easily. But suddenly, Harry appeared in front of him with tin cans in his hands. Mike wondered when the man had managed to get here. Tossing one of the cans, Harry said with a grin on his face that these bastards must be really hungry, since they decided to feast on people. And then he quickly waved his hand. And all the jars that were in his hands flew at the monsters. However, this only made the monsters even more angry. But then something cut the monster in half. Harry rushed forward, cutting through the monsters that were in his path, and he cried out, asking them if they knew who they were opening their mouths on. The man's eyes glowed green as the monster's bodies fell to the ground, and he said that normal mobs should know their place. Scott and Charlie stared at this with their mouths open. Suddenly, a message appeared in front of the man's face, stating that he had destroyed the attractor. There were reports that he had increased the Divine Throne EXP and obtained a consumable material. A sparkling shard appeared on the man's hand, and a message appeared stating that consumables could be used to create new skills and relics. Clutching the shard in his hand, the man thought that despite the 50% penalty to his physical capabilities, moving didn't seem that difficult, and perhaps he could use even more energy than before. Mike thought that it was impossible for a man to easily destroy S-Class monsters that even he couldn't stop. Harry approached Scott to return the knife he had taken from his house. Mike didn't take his eyes off him and wondered where he came from. But suddenly he remembered something, and then he called out to Harry, calling him an amateur, and he turned his head. And then he cried out that he was the same man who had attacked their followers, and Harry, hearing this, shuddered. And he immediately remembered the couple he had recently beaten up. But then he hit the man in the face, telling him to shut up. Mike fell to the ground from the blow, and his body shook slightly. Harry asked him how he guessed. Mike exclaimed again, asking him how he could not recognize him. And then he pointed out that the man had put on the clothes and badge of the man he had beaten. 
and he said that this badge is an S-rank relic given only to the Templars of the Twin Branch. And then he cried out that he was sure that all the man's strength was hidden in this badge, and Harry only disgustedly took it off himself and asked how this nasty thing ended up on him. And then he squeezed the badge with his fingers, destroying the abomination. Seeing this, Mike became even more angry. Dusting his hands, Harry said that the relic was nothing more than a decoration, and he couldn't believe that those bastards hadn't changed a bit in 20 years. But suddenly a furious cry of a monster sounded next to them. Harry immediately put on a serious face and looked towards the sound. Charlie also looked in that direction and pointed at something with his shaking finger. As it turned out, it was the Spider Queen, who was riding a monster and chasing people. Then the men tensed up and Harry's body was covered in green light. And then this light became even brighter, and streams of wind gathered around it. And a second later, he was already rushing forward. He rushed straight towards the Spider Queen. Flying closer, he raised his hand and struck at the head of the monster on which the queen was. From this blow, the monster immediately fell to the ground, breaking the stone covering. People looked around in panic at the loud sound. Mike was also watching this, but he had absolutely no idea what the hell was going on. It seemed completely insane to him that the man would rush at this monster without any relic on him. Suddenly, a voice was heard in his ears, calling for the attention of all the Templars of the Gemini branch. Scott and Mike, who heard the voice, immediately realized that it was Bishop Simon. Simon told Scott and Mike to get out of that building immediately. He said that the people from the Ares branch intend to completely seal the building. He said that Victor was already on his way here, and they couldn't stop him. And besides, even a saint couldn't cope with the Spider Queen. That's why they decided to get rid of the place completely, because the saints would get into trouble if people found out about their failure. He asked Mike if he had a teleportation skill, and then he told him to take Scott and get out of there. The man's eyes began to dart nervously around the building. People were injured and some could barely move on their own. Everything was almost resolved, but the monsters continued to crawl out of the crevice, and only Harry still fought with the Spider Queen. The man's body suddenly began to tremble. Simon asked him if there was any problem with them leaving together. With a crazy face, Mike replied that there was no problem. Scott cried out, asking what he was talking about. The outside help was clearly not enough. Didn't he understand how badly they were stuck? He asked him if he really wanted to leave all these people to die. After a short silence, the man replied that he understood everything. But what will people think when the Spider Queen appears in the middle of the city? Hearing this question, the guy froze and asked again. Mike replied that then people would begin to reproach the branches of the constellations, and their faith would weaken. And because of this, their strength would also waver. He took out his phone and said that he could only take one person with him, and Scott would go with him, since he was ordered to save him. Scott cried out that he couldn't leave his friend here to die, and besides, a lot of people hadn't had time to evacuate yet. The man gritted his teeth and said that now was not the time for his whims. He said he had no desire to die here because of an incompetent freak like him. And the man's hand began to turn into ice. Steam from the ice swirled around him, and he said he would have to kill all the extra cargo so the guy wouldn't have much of a choice. These words angered the guy, and a blue light appeared around him. The guy stood in a stance, and flashes of blue light flew around him. Coming closer, Mike asked him if he was really going to fight him. He said they were on completely different levels and he needed to put his miserable conscience aside and make a rational decision. But before he could say anything else, something hit him in the back. As it turned out, it was the paw of a monster that was now pressing the man to the ground. Harry landed next to her on the ground and wondered why they were still here. He said that it was dangerous here, and therefore they should leave quickly. Charlie called out to the man happily, and Scott said that the draggers had blocked the exit so they couldn't get out of here. The guy said they should either use the teleporter or destroy all the monsters here. Looking around, the guy noted that there were currently a lot of wounded in the building, and the people from the Ares branch decided to seal the entire building. Harry swore in response, saying that it was just a headache, and Mike began to crawl out from under the rubble with groaning sounds. With a sudden movement, he rose to his feet, scattering the debris around him, and then he shouted, telling Harry to come to him. Harry said that he thought the man had already chickened out and ran away at the speed of light, to which the man shouted at him to shut up. Mike grabbed the phone and shouted that they would see who could get out of here alive, and maybe he could get out alone. But before he could press the button to teleport away, a web appeared behind him. As it turned out, it was the Spider Queen who launched a web at the man, grabbing him. Mike turned around in panic and swore quietly. Then the monster pulled on its web, throwing the man into its mouth. The phone fell out of his hands and hit the ground with a dull thud. Harry, without a second's delay, turned to the boys standing behind him. Turning around, he told them to take care of the wounded, and he would sort everything out here, and then he would join them. 
A green light enveloped his body as he said it wouldn't take long. Meanwhile, the Ares branching barrier continued to surround the building. Victor had already arrived at the scene, and he asked his subordinate about the current situation, to which he replied that their people had already practically sealed off the hypermarket. The building was cordoned off. Victor asked if the work was going too slowly, considering that they had started it long before his arrival. The branching people who created the barrier asked why the protection was not holding up properly, as if something was about to break out. And at that very moment, a bright light illuminated the entire building. This caused a wind to rise, and Victor's subordinates began to defend their commander. And the next moment, a huge turquoise snake burst out of the building, Victor exclaimed, asking what the hell was going on here. Where did the snake come from? People ran out of the hypermarket with frightened screams. This crowd was met by Victor's subordinates, and the crowd screamed for help, and they said that there was some guy there alone fighting with the queen. Hearing this, Victor wondered what they were talking about, because even he alone could not contain such monsters. And then he stepped forward and said that he would see with his own eyes, in response to which his subordinates exclaimed that it was dangerous. But this did not stop the man. And the next moment a gust of wind arose, and the man's figure became blurry. Victor jumped up sharply, pushing off the walls of the building. He jumped into one of the broken windows. He looked up and saw something that shocked him, and he swore quietly. As it turned out, what he saw was the lifeless body of the Spider Queen. The man's face twisted into a frightened expression as he wondered who could have done such a thing. Looking around, he noticed that there was a real massacre here. He wondered what it was, whether someone was deliberately hunting the Spider Queen. Clutching his head, he said that with every second his headache was getting worse and that he already had enough problems. Suddenly, he felt a familiar energy and looked somewhere to the side. Following this energy, the man ran to the window to see who it belonged to. Looking out the window, he saw a familiar figure and wondered what that bastard was doing here. As it turned out, that bastard was Hugo, who had already arrived in Korea. He stepped one foot on the edge and wondered if this could all have been Hugo's doing. Then it would make sense. But then a voice came from behind him, asking if he missed him, and it made the man's body shudder. Harry, who appeared behind him, his eyes sparkling, asked him what was the matter, what was wrong. He asked him with a smirk on his face what that expression was since they hadn't seen each other for so long. Victor immediately hurried to turn around to look at the other, but he was too shocked to utter a word. Meanwhile, rescuers arrived at the hypermarket and began evacuating people, and Charlie and Scott were sitting on the ground, wrapped in blankets. Scott wondered if the man could really be Harry, because even though he looked different, his movements were definitely similar. Suddenly, someone shouted Scott's name. As it turned out, it was a breathless Hugo who asked the guy what he was doing. Turning away from the man, the boy asked him what he was doing there, to which he responded by asking if that was the right way to greet one's own father. Hearing this, Charlie laughed, and Scott just clicked his tongue in irritation. Hugo took his chin in his hand thoughtfully, looking cautiously at his son, and then he said that at least he was not hurt, and a little medical attention would quickly return him to action. And then he asked him if he saw who did all this to the monsters since he was in the building when it happened. But instead of answering, Scott only turned away from his father even more and the man thought irritably about who he got his character from, and the guy asked his friend if everything would be okay with Harry. Hearing this, the man ran up to Charlie and grabbed him sharply by the shoulders, and then he cried out, asking the guy if he really knew Harry, and the guy asked again, not understanding, and then the guy said that now he understood who the man meant. When he called him by this strange nickname, it turned out it was Hugo. And then he said that the man was in the hypermarket right now, and by the way, he defeated the Spider Queen, and he introduced himself to them as Harry. The man, still holding the boy by the shoulders, told him to describe everything in more detail. But before the guy could say anything, a loud sound was heard in the building and something hit the wall. Meanwhile, Victor was fighting with Harry. He jumped away from him, already out of breath. Harry was absolutely fine, and he said it was too much. Wiping his face with his hand, he said that they met for the first time in 20 years, and the first thing the man decided to do was attack him. Victor asked the man how he managed to survive at all. And then he looked at his face and thought that the man looked very much like Harry. But where were his ugly scars? And his voice was different from before. He thought about how he looked too young. And then Victor shouted at him about how this little bastard dared to imitate Harry. And he even got worried for a moment. Harry asked again, uncomprehendingly. Victor screamed that this bastard dared to deceive him. And therefore he would pay for it with his life. While Harry calmly asked what he was even talking about. And then he hit him in the stomach with a sharp movement, screaming that all this time he had been profiting from others, deceiving them. The man quickly flew back from this blow, but Harry didn't stop there, 
and with a quick movement he found himself behind the man to strike again. He hit the man again and he flew straight into the ground. Lying on the ground, Victor began to make muffled sounds, and Harry lowered himself to the ground and began to approach him. He said that he needed to teach each of them a good lesson, and then he asked about how he had lived while he was imprisoned in the demonic tower. He asked and said that they had appropriated his relics and wealth, and even divided his will. Clenching his fist in his hand, he said with a smile on his face that it was okay. He was going to finish them all off anyway. He began to list the order in which he would destroy everything he had, and the man began to shake with fear. Harry exclaimed that he would destroy everything he held dear, and it seemed to hit Victor hard on the head. He gritted his teeth and thought that this couldn't be happening. As he rose to his feet, he thought that the man was not bluffing, because his manner of behavior and speech were so similar, and he could not even recognize his movements. Could he really be that Harry? Could he really have escaped from the demonic tower? Victor stood up and said that all this was nonsense, and then everything was illuminated with a red light and Victor's body rose above the ground. Swords began to appear from behind him, and the man told the other to prove to him that he was the same Harry. A magic circle with an image of Ares appeared under Victor, and swords appeared from the portal behind his back. Then a hat and mantle appeared on the man's body, like those of the emperors of ancient dynasties. A message has emerged that the sacred entity of the Ares constellation, the Jade Emperor, has revealed itself. Harry chuckled and asked if even a holy being had decided to honor him with its presence. Victor raised his finger, pointing at the man, his eyes glowing red, and red chains grew out of the ground around Harry. These chains began to wrap around his body, restricting his movements. Victor asked him if he still considered them weaklings. A wave of swords flew through the air, and the man said that he did not know how the other managed to survive in that tower. Victor raised his hands to the sky, preparing to use the heavenly weapon to attack the chained Harry. A multitude of swords rushed towards Harry in waves. Harry said with an emotionless face that the Emperor's power was really amazing. Victor waved his hand, shouting for him to shut up, and the swords sped up. 